Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the very first iFi Colloquium. Uh, my name is Jesse Thaler, and I'm the director of the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And uh, we're gonna be having uh, Jim Halverson, who is our colloquium organizer, introduce our speaker, Fiala Shanahan. But because this is our first uh, broadcast of our colloquium series, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background about what iFi is before we kick off the, uh, the talk. So what is iFi? Um, it's a new NSF funded AI Institute uh, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. It's a joint venture between MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And you can go to our website, ifi.org, to learn more about what we're doing. Uh, but the overarching goal is to advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and galvanize AI research innovation. And these twin goals are represented in our logo here, which you can see either as a capital A with a lowercase i on top of it for AI, or an F and an I next to each other for fundamental interactions. And we really see great synergies between these two research directions. Um, so who are we? Uh, we are uh, 27 investigators in the Boston area and a similar number of, uh, of students and postdocs who are participating. And uh, we feel that we have a critical mass for transformative research at this intersection of physics and AI. But though we have this critical mass, uh, we need to develop a shared language. And these colloquia and other iFi events, the goal is to increase the cross section for these interdisciplinary interactions. And so, actually, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, this colloquium series is as much about us talking to each other within iFi as well as broadcasting to, 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 to the world about what's going on here. And uh, while, uh, for example, Fiala Shanahan is my colleague in the MIT Center for Theoretical Physics, uh, there are other uh, folks within iFi who haven't had a chance to hear about the great work that she's gonna be telling you about today. In terms of the intellectual theme, and this is gonna be echoed in, uh, in the talk today, um, the intellectual theme of iFi is to develop what we're calling ab initio artificial intelligence. So ab initio from first principles, um, and the idea is to develop machine learning that incorporates first principles, best practices, and domain knowledge from fundamental physics. And you can think about this kind of like, how do you teach a machine to think like a physicist? How do you incorporate the tools that we use, either in theoretical physics or experimental physics, uh, into machine learning architectures? And uh, you're going to hear about today things like symmetries or guarantees of exactness. These are things that uh, theoretical physicists care a lot about. Can we bake those into machine learning architectures? Roughly speaking, um, uh, iFi has three uh, research thrusts in theoretical physics, experimental physics, and foundational AI. And in these colloquium series that we're gonna have every other week, you're gonna hear about all the various activities in these, uh, in these areas. And if I represent iFi as a proton with uh, uh, physics theory, physics experiment, and AI foundations as the kind of quarks of that proton, what we need to have a coherent institute are gluons. Um, and uh, these iFi colloquia are one way of building gluons, but also people are a way that we're building gluons. And you can see here our iFi fellows, uh, our postdoctoral fellows, who we think are going to forge connections between the various parts of iFi. And uh, I'm pleased to announce for the, for the first time today, the selection of our 2021, uh, 2024 iFi fellows, uh, the gluons of iFi, who we hope will spark multi-investigator, multi-subfield collaborations. So uh, you'll be hearing you know, later on in the future from Anna Golubeva, uh, D. Luo, Siddharth Mishra Sharma, uh, Ga Yang. And in addition to our iFi fellowship program, uh, in the coming months, we're gonna be launching various iFi activities to complement the research program of iFi, things like workforce development, digital learning, outreach, broadening participation, knowledge transfer, and so on. Uh, so with that, let me leave a, uh, a summary slide about uh, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. Uh, thank you all for coming to this colloquium. We look forward to building collaborations and synergies within Boston, but also for those of you who are listening in uh, abroad, uh, uh, those connections uh, beyond. And so with that, let me turn it over to Jim Halverson, who will introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. It's good to see so many of you here at our first iFi colloquium. Uh, it's wonderful to have the ball rolling and to be telling you about some of the work going on at our institute. Today, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome Professor Fiala Shanahan of MIT as our first iFi colloquium speaker. She received her PhD in 2015 from the University of Adelaide and was a professor at William & Mary from 27 to 2018, and began her professorship at MIT in, in 2018. Professor Shanahan is renowned for her work 
on the structure of uh, hadronic uh, interactions and nuclei, which earned her early career awards from the Department of Energy and the NSF, as well as many prestigious prizes and awards, including the Maria Goppert Meyer Award and the 2020 Kenneth G. Wilson Award in lattice field theory. Today, she will tell us about her work at the interface of lattice field theory and machine learning, aimed at a better understanding of the structure of matter. With that introduction, I invite you to welcome me in, uh, to, to, to join me in welcoming Professor Shanahan and to ask questions at the end of her presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, it's an absolute pleasure to be here to give the first iFi colloquium. Now, this talk, oh, yes, recording's good. So this talk is about how we can use AI to learn about the structure of matter. Now, of course, matter is composed of atoms, which have a densely packed nuclear core of protons and neutrons orbited by a cloud of electrons. And our modern understanding is that the structure of matter goes one layer deeper, that the protons and neutrons inside an atomic nucleus themselves have substructure. They're made of matter particles called quarks, held bound tightly together by the strong force manifesting as force carrying particles known as gluons. And to the best of our current understanding, quarks and gluons are it. They are fundamental particles. They can't be divided any further. And to the best of our current understanding, the structure and interactions, not just of protons and neutrons, but of atomic nuclei, all the way up the periodic table, ultimately chemistry, come out of the dynamics of these interacting fundamental particles. Now, the quarks and the gluons and their interactions are encoded in what's known as the standard model of elementary particles. The framework was put together in the 1970s. It contains just 17 fundamental particles. You can see them here, including the quarks and gluons that I mentioned before. And it describes three of the four fundamental forces, notably excluding gravity, in a very elegant and beautiful and very predictive framework. This theory, it's, it's an extraordinarily successful description of the matter in our universe. It's withstood almost every experimental test. And one reason for studying this theory is to really understand how all of the complexity that we observe in nature comes out of this deceptively simple framework that's here on my slide. But of course, also, despite its successes, the standard model does not describe everything we observe about the universe. And we make huge efforts in the physics community to understand and constrain physics beyond the standard model from dark matter and dark energy through to how gravity fits in. And so studying the standard model then is both interesting for its own sake as an exploration of the structure of matter in our universe, but it's also critical for our searches for physics beyond the standard model. It, it's necessary for the background and benchmarks for all of those experiments that we of course use standard model particles for in our detectors and in our experiments here on Earth. So we can study the standard model mathematically and make predictions from this theory in what we call first principles calculations. But this, as we'll get into more later, demands extreme scale computation. That is of the order of 10% of open science supercomputing in the United States just for these types of calculations. And we're still computationally limited. So just to give you a, a concrete physics goal, um, there's, for example, not enough supercomputing in the world to compute standard model predictions for dark matter scattering from some of the nuclei we use in detectors, even though we know in principle how to do it. So it's natural to ask if we can do more, do it faster with artificial intelligence or machine learning tools. But since we're doing first principles theory calculations, where we're specifically computing exactly what our theory predicts, these calculations also demand exactness. They demand that the complex symmetries of the standard model are exactly respected. So we look to accelerate these calculations with ab initio AI. So as Jesse said in the introduction to our institute, ab initio AI is really the theme of our institute. And it's exactly this idea of incorporating fundamental physics principles into AI to solve problems in fundamental physics and beyond in other fields. So, and as our institute is inspired by the challenges of fundamental physics, so physics and in particular the structure of matter inspires the structure of our institute with our thrusts of physics theory, physics experiment and AI foundations, the quarks of our institute and our fellows, the gluons that bind us together. And today my focus is on this red quark here. So ab initio AI for physics theory, but as we'll see the thrusts are really deeply intertwined. So 
what can ab initio AI do for ab initio studies of the standard model? After a little bit of more introduction to the specific computational problems that we're trying to solve with AI, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. So to talk about first principle standard model calculations is really to talk about the strong force that's quantum chromodynamics. It's part of the standard model. Um, it's the strong force is the strongest of the four forces in nature. It, it binds quarks and gluons together into protons and neutrons and pions, and it binds protons and neutrons into nuclei. So it's of course relevant to discussions of the structure of matter. But this theory is a challenge to study because it's what we call non-perturbative at low energy scales. So that's like the energy scales relevant to the structure of a nucleus at rest. So what that means is that the coupling of the theory is large at low energy scales. That's what you can see here on the figure where the horizontal axis is the energy scale and the vertical axis is the coupling of the theory. If the coupling is small, you can expand in powers of that coupling. Squaring a small number is small, squaring it again is smaller still. And so you can expand to some order and then stop and have your calculation to some desired position. If the coupling's large, you can't do that sort of a perturbative expansion. And QCD, the theory of the strong interactions, falls into this category. So the only way we know how to study the strong interactions in a systematically improvable way is through what we call lattice field theory. So the idea is just to take the equations of QCD, which when we're computing some observable look like integrals over the values of quark and gluon fields and discretize it onto a four dimensional space time grid or lattice. Um, then those integrals um, can be done numerically. And what they look like is, is very high dimensional integrals over something like 10 to the nine to 10 to the 12 variables for state of the art calculations. So of course doing integrations in such a high dimensional space is hard. We evaluate them by what's called important sampling with the idea being that we know some contributions to the integral are more important than others. Um, you can think about just quantum mechanics. You know that paths near the classical action dominate. It's the same sort of thing here. And you can sample those correspondingly more and sample the others correspondingly less. And that's how you can do efficiently an integral in such a high dimensional space numerically. So let's go into just a little bit more detail on what this means, because of course it's key to our computational challenges. Um, you discretize the theory onto your space-time grid. Of course, you have to take some limit as the grid spacing becomes small to recover continuum um, standard model physics, continuum QCD. And the integral I'm talking about can be written out like this within the framework of quantum field theory, which is um, the, the, the framework that describes theories like QCD. We have this integral over values of quark and gluon fields here, and we see that it's weighted by the exponential of the action S that's the function that describes the quark and gluon dynamics of the theory. Now, if we sample those fields with this exponential of the action already baked in, then computing these quantities, these observables, things we'd like to measure and then compare to experiment, these O's, um, becomes just a matter of calculating O on each of these samples and taking means and standard deviations. So the challenge, and, and one particular challenge that will focus on this talk is this sampling challenge. How do you generate samples distributed according to this known function, this exponential of the action that describes the dynamics of the theory? So here is this problem. We want to generate field configurations with this known probability distribution here. So what these field configurations look like in a QCD calculation, we have our four dimensional lattice here, although I've drawn a three dimensional one. And each link, each edge here of this lattice is represented by an SU3 matrix. That's a three by three complex matrix with unit determinant. And each, each lattice, each configuration has something like 10 to the 10 links. So we have something like 10 to the 12 double precision numbers with this very specific matrix structure. And so we want to sample these where each sample has these 10 to the 12 numbers according to this very specific known probability distribution. The way these samples are traditionally generated is through Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo, which you can think of as being a coupled walk in position and momentum space through Hamiltonian dynamics to explore the space. So this is much more efficient than a random walk in such a high dimensional space. And like we're visualizing here, you can really think of this process as simultaneously exploring your level sets in probability density space while jumping to nearby level sets, um, all the while sampling in a whale that preserves the probability distribution. So what this sort of a sampling approach means in practice 
is that you're generating samples in a chain, updating from one to the next. And so then there are correlations between the samples in the chain um, de described by some autocorrelation time. And that time is related to the cost to generate independent samples, which might require some uh, number of updates larger than one in, in your chain. Now, a particular challenge for lattice field theory calculations is that this, this procedure, this Hamiltonian dynamics with a Markov chain Monte Carlo, is in some sense diffusive or close to local. So it, it spreads out like this. And what that means is that if what you're really interested in is generating independent samples that are independent on some physical length scale, like the size of a proton, that as you make the ladder spacing small, the number of updates you need to change physics on that fixed scale becomes larger and larger. And this is a manifestation of critical slowing down in this, in this context. And so this is a significant computational challenge. And so just, just to give you a, a picture of the slowing down, in this chart, we have the autocorrelation measure, so a measure of how correlated the sample is, how expensive it is to generate independent samples. And on the horizontal axis, moving from right to left is moving towards the critical limit. And each of these lines here corresponds to some different observable and how correlated they are between steps in the chain. And you can see they all diverge exponentially badly as we move along the critical line. So this is a critical growth in cost. So this critical slowing down is exactly one of the challenges that my group's been working to address with Ab Initio AI in what's grown into a big and really dynamic and engaging collaboration. And you see here some of the faces of the team who are most involved in the work that I'll be talking about today. So just before I dive into some of the details in this example, I also want to make it clear that my team isn't the only one working on AI for some of the challenges in field theory. So I'll talk only about the work in the green box here, but I want you to notice I'm summarizing here some of the other work in this field, and I'd like you to notice the dates. And you'll see that almost every single one of the papers that I'm referencing here is from 2020 or 2021. So this is a new and rapidly growing endeavor that is really still in its infancy. So still, we're mostly working with toy models, but it has huge potential to impact first principle physics studies. And with any approach, what's really, really critical is that we preserve the fact that we are rigorously studying a quantum field theory in all of the relevant limits, and hence ab initio AI. Okay, so to explain the idea and the challenge and some of the solutions we're developing, we can first consider a simple test case of a scalar lattice field theory. So this is a, a field theory, but where each configuration just looks like a real number on each site of a two-dimensional grid here. So there's a very clear analogy to images. It's easy to visualize what the configurations look like. There are some here on this slide. Then this action, this function of the quark and gluon dynamics looks like this. You can see there's some derivative terms, some squared terms, a quartic term in the field. These parameters here, m and lambda, those are free parameters that specify the dynamics of the theory. Like in QCD, the theory of the strong interactions, the quark masses say are free from. So then the action is specified and the problem is let's generate these field configurations um, with this probability distribution given by this function here. So there is a very clear parallel here to an image generation problem that's of course received a lot of attention in the machine learning community. We want to generate samples that look like this. You can see here the probabilities, the log probability for each of these samples. And much less often we want to generate samples that look like this. This is just random noise. So you can see there's some characteristic length scale of correlations in our typical samples. Of course, an image generation problem is that you want to generate these pictures of faces, um, which are not photographs. These are generated by an AI model. And of course, you don't want to generate random noise, which looks like this. So there's a very clear parallel. And also with one difference that's already very clear in this picture, that we do actually want this configuration just very rarely and with a very precise probability given by the exponential of the action. Whereas generating pictures of faces, you, you, you never want this random noise. So let's think about some more of the differences. So another difference is the symmetries involved in our physics calculations. So the physics and hence the probability to generate each sample is invariant under very specific field transformations. So one is rotations and translations with four dimensional boundary conditions. So if this is a gauge field configuration, we have exactly the same probability of generating this 
field configuration, which just looks like a rotation and a translation. And more than simple symmetries like this, we also have gauge transformations, which is a complication we can avoid for scalar field theory, but we'll come back to because it's critical in QCD. And when each link is a matrix, your physics is invariant under very specific transformations. We left and right multiply each matrix by a different matrix in a correlated way across the lattice. So that this configuration and this one encode the same physics and have exactly the same probability. So if we sort of stack up and compare our machine learning for QCD versus our machine learning for say image generation, we see a few differences. So already we talked about symmetries and we talked about the fact that it's really the ensemble of gauge fields that has meaning. We need a precise probability distribution rather than just individual samples that are good. But here's another difference. Our data hierarchies are inverted and very challenging. So if each sample in a state-of-the-art calculation is described by something like 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 numbers, and we want order thousands of samples, that's the inverse of what you often have in other applications where you might have an image being described by something like 3,000 samples, but 3,000 numbers, but you have hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of samples available as training data. So clearly with this inversion of the data hierarchy, any approach that uses training data is gonna be very challenging to implement. And moreover, of course, the symmetries that we have um, don't appear in, in other contexts here, at least not in image contexts. So it's clear that we need some sort of custom machine learning for physics from the ground up with everything built in, which brings us again to ab initio AI. So we can start, however, by adapting tools from image generation for the scalar field theory example. So one approach to this generation problem is via what are known as flow models. And the idea is very, very simple. It's just a change of variables. So if you have a change of variables, that takes you from a simple distribution that's easy to sample to the complex and hard to sample distribution that you're really interested in, then you've solved your sampling problem. You just take samples from the easy distribution, you put them through your function, your change of variables, and out come the samples that you really want. So if you also have such a function that's invertible and has a tractable Jacobian, then you can explicitly calculate the likelihood for each generated sample and assuming your prior distribution has density everywhere, you can make your sampling exact, even if your model, your change of variables is not exact via a Metropolis Hastings except reject step. So this combination, this having an expressive function that you can optimize to give you the change of variables that you're interested in, and the fact that you have um, your invertible and tractable Jacobian means that you can have exact sampling in the asymptotic limit from an inexact model. Okay, so we'd like this very general function, but still to maintain the fact that it's invertible and has a Jacobian that we can compute. And we can do that while maintaining all the features we need by building a complicated function as the composition of many simple layers with specific features. So for this example of scalar field theory, we can use what are called real non-volume preserving flows. So just to unpack that language, the, the non-volume preserving part just means that the density can be squished or, or stretched by the change of variables. The real part just means we're acting on real numbers. And what one of these layers looks like then is that half of the data, if we say checkerboard our lattice here in, in black and green, so half of the data, the black half is updated by a scaling and a translation parameterized by the other half by the green half of the data. So we take the black data, we apply an exponential scaling, we apply a translation, both of which can be parameterized by arbitrary neural networks. They can be as complicated as we like, as long as they depend only on the green data. And then what we have is a transformation um, that still gives us a nice upper or lower triangular Jacobian when we compose all our layers together. So we still have a tractable inverse and Jacobian despite a complicated function. So we can optimize or train the free parameters inside that function. So the parameters inside the neural networks in each layer without any training data at all, which is critical for our case where typically we don't have the training data. And if we had it, then we'd have the samples we need and we'd be done. Um, so we can do this optimization by taking samples from the model and then minimizing the difference between the likelihood 
of drawing each sample from the model, which is something that we can compute, and the likelihood with which we should have drawn them from the model if we had our true distribution. So we can write that. So this function that we're trying to optimize as, as a loss, something that we're trying to minimize through our optimization or training procedure. It's, it's here a, a shifted kullback leibler divergence, but you can see the definition here. This, this function had its minimum when our model distribution P tilde is the same as the distribution we want defined as P. And we can compute this just stochastically by drawing samples from our model and then computing this, this log of our probability of the samples plus the action which we can compute per sample. So once we've trained, we can then guarantee exactness of our sampling by composing those samples, which we draw completely independently, but we can then compose those samples into a Markov chain and do an accept reject step of each sample based on the previous sample. So again, the samples are completely independent. You, you get each sample by taking a, a sample from your easy distribution, pushing it through your function, but then you can compose them into a chain. And by doing so, and then accept or rejecting each sample with this probability, which is given by the ratio of the model probability P tilde to the true probability P of those samples, you can show that you have asymptotic exactness, that you do have the right probability distribution in the limit of an infinite number of samples, which is the same criteria that we have, the, the same guarantees that we have with the traditional sampling approaches. So what the whole procedure looks like then from, from top to bottom is that you parameterize this flow, this change of variables from an easy distribution to the hard one, you train it. And what that looks like is by drawing samples from the model, you compute the loss function, do gradient descent and iterate, you save the trained model, and then you have an embarrassingly parallel sampling procedure and you can form a Markov chain using the samples from those models. So let's look at this in action. So again, a reminder, our first example is a simple scalar lattice field theory where we just have one real number per lattice site. So they just look like images essentially. And we want a probability distribution defined by this action, which just has some kinetic derivative terms and our, our quartic coupling here. So we can study this theory on a number of different lattice sizes with different parameters, M and Lambda. And the, the only real feature of these values that I've chosen here is that they're tuned for an analysis of this critical slowing down problem. So then on, on each set of parameters, we can choose the prior distribution just to be Gaussian noise, uncorrelated Gaussians at each site. We feed that Gaussian noise through our function, which is built up of these real non-volume preserving coupling layers, eight to 12 layers. We can use that checkerboard pattern for the variable splitting. Within each layer, we have neural networks with, in this case, something like two to six fully connected layers with hundreds to thousands of hidden units. Then we optimize this whole function and then we stop and we can take samples from the model. And what we see is that in fact, um, you can see an elimination of critical slowing down in this approach as you must, because you're not updating from one sample to the next in the chain, you're sampling entirely independently. So that comes of course at the cost of the upfront training cost of the model. So essentially we're trading in a, a cost in sampling that you pay every time you generate a sample for an upfront training cost that you pay once and then is amortized over however many samples you want to generate. So what that looks like in figures here is on each vertical axis here, we have the integrated autocorrelation time, which you can think of as being a measure of the cost. And on the horizontal axis, we're moving along a critical line in terms of these different parameters of the ensembles that we're looking at. In the gray, we have traditional sampling approaches like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or hybrid Monte Carlo and local metropolis. And what you see is that the cost, this autocorrelation time diverges exponentially badly as we move from left to right. But with the samples drawn from machine learning models, you, you have no slowing down. And that just comes from the fact that if you train your model to some fixed acceptance rate, um, then, then you must have a flat line here, but because you're taking samples entirely independently from your model of course, at the cost of the upfront training. So no, no critical slowing down here um, once you've trained the model. So this is a nice toy example, um, but it's a long way from lattice field theory calculations for nuclear and particle physics. So what we'd really like to do is solve some of these key physics problems, like for example, computing um, the rate of dark matter scattering from the nuclei in our detector.
So what we need to do is scale up. We need to go from this toy example in two dimensions to four dimensions. We need to scale the number of degrees of freedom from these small 16 by 16 boxes to something state of the art, something like 48 cubed by 96 boxes or even larger. So these are challenging engineering problems, but in principle, we know how to do them. Here are some samples generated from a three-dimensional model for scalar field theory. Um, we have a program with the Aurora 21 early science program. Aurora will be the new largest supercomputer to be built in the United States. And so the goal is to scale these methods for applications on Aurora. But there's still conceptual challenges in moving to QCD, which are in particular the fact that we have a gauge field theory with these additional complicated symmetries and not a real number at each site, but a matrix on each link of the lattice. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. So a reminder of what our gauge fields look like in the case of QCD is that the field configurations don't have real numbers at each site, but we have each link, each edge of this lattice with a matrix. For QCD, it's three by three complex matrices with unit determinant. So the first thing is that we notice is that these matrices, they're group elements. They live in compact connected manifolds, not on the real line. And secondly, there are important symmetries in this theory as we've already discussed. So I'll talk briefly about the first problem. So what we had before, something like real non-volume preserving flows, it, they give us functions that map from some number on the real line or some distribution on the real line to some other distribution on the real line. But as soon as we're on a compact connected manifold, the picture looks something different. So we can look at just a circle to start with. We have a number on the circle. We want to map it to another number on the circle. So we have a, a qualitatively different picture here. So ultimately what we're interested in is we want a, a, a diffeomorphism, an, an isomorphism of these smooth manifolds. We want an invertible differentiable function um, and that maps one differentiable manifold to another so that both the function and its inverse are smooth. So we can write down um, some conditions under which you have such a diffeomorphism, such a map that we can build layers out of. We want very general maps. So you also want ways of defining them in a very flexible way so that they're able to be optimized to whatever shape your map needs to take. So we can make them more expressive by composing these maps, by taking combinations of these maps so just some examples, um, and we're not the first to talk about any of these types of diffeomorphisms, but we did a nice study of different ways you can map, say, numbers on the circle back to numbers on the circle in a flexible and expressive way. So, for example, you can talk about Mobius transformations. All this is doing is it's mapping this number Z to this parameterized number here, this number H omega Z, which is parameterized by omega. And essentially it's expanding the part of the sphere close to this parameter omega and contracting the rest. You can write down splines, uh, you need some coefficients on them, uh, some, some constraints on them to guarantee um, that, that it's still nice and invertible, then they're analytically invertible. Um, you can write down non-compact projections, which is basically projecting to the real line and, and back again. It can be a bit numerically unstable near the endpoint, so you have to be careful and tailor expand near those but you can define different ways of defining these maps on the circle. And once you have maps on the circle, you can extend them. You can extend them to four I, so Cartesian products of circles and intervals. You can extend recursively to D-dimensional spheres. And you need to be careful um, that, that everything still works nicely numerically, so it's stable and the density is well behaved everywhere, but you can essentially solve this problem. So, more complicated is, is the problem of symmetries. And so I do want to note that actually incorporating the symmetries isn't essential for the exactness of any distributions we generate by sampling from these, from these models. Um, you're, you're sampling the fact that you have density everywhere in your prior distribution, and the fact that you're doing your accept reject step when you compose your samples into a chain will guarantee exactness even if your distribution isn't symmetric. But when you have such high dimensional samples that you're trying to generate, have such a high dimensional space and you have such high dimensional symmetries, it's much, much more efficient. And in fact, we've found crucial to bake those symmetries in. So just a visualization, if you have a symmetry along this axis here um, and what you're trying to do is approximate that symmetry, of course, it's, it's much, much harder 
to build this function as an approximation to this function than to eliminate that redundant dimension entirely and do a simpler approximation and modeling task. So building in these symmetries is not essential for correctness, but it's essential for practicality. So what we ultimately want is a flow, a function, this change of variables defined from coupling layers, and we'd like it to be invariant under the symmetry. And what that means is we'd like it to produce samples where if the samples are related by a gauge transformation, then they're produced with exactly the same probability because they, they, they should be from our physics model. Now we can create such an invariant function from equivariant coupling layers if the prior distribution is symmetric. So, so what I mean is for the function to be invariant, you only need two conditions. The first being that the prior is symmetric and the second that the transformations commute through every application of your coupling layer. That's what I mean by equivariant as opposed to invariant. Then your whole function will be invariant to your symmetry. So we can look at a simple example that ties back to our, our discussion of flows on a circle, a U1 field theory, where each link is, is not an SUN matrix, but just uh, an, an element on the circle. And what that looks like then, our gauge transformation that we want to be invariant under, looks like each link here is going to be left and right multiplied by another U1 group element. So just E to the I phi, a complex number on the unit circle in a way that is um, correlated across the lattice. So we're, we're left multiplying here by omega x and right multiplying by omega x plus mu hat, where x is indexing the different sites of this lattice of this field configuration. So we can make a coupling layer that's equivariant to this transformation um, in the following way. So first, let's remember that these group elements, as I said, are on the links of the lattice. So what the coupling layer is doing is it's taking us from the space-time dimension times the lattice volume of those group elements to space-time dimension times lattice volume number of group elements. We want to split our variables in half again, remembering that variable splitting is what gave us that the Jacobian is lower triangular and easily computed. So we want our coupling layer to update some fraction of the links in a lattice, which we'll call blue here in A, and leave the other fraction of the links alone. So you can write down an equivariant coupling layer via what we call a kernel H mapping from the group element back to the group element. And we can achieve equivariance under a very simple condition, which is always satisfied for abelian groups like in U1 field theory, which looks like this, where the action of the kernel is this. So this is a somewhat impenetrable equation. So we'll look at a figure describing what this kernel is doing. We're going to update our link u i here in blue. That's this link on our lattice. And to do that update, we're going to first compose that link into a structure which has a much simpler transformation property under the gauge transformation. This link gets left and right multiplied by different matrices. But if we compose that link into a loop that starts and ends at the same point, then the gauge transformation property in that loop is left and right multiplied by the same matrix, which is, which is much easier. So we're going to compose the link into a loop. We're going to update that loop. So here it looks like a variable on the circle. We're going to have an update that transforms the distribution of that variable on the circle. And we're going to parameterize that transformation only by what we call frozen parts of the lattice that we leave alone. This is like our checkerboard variable splitting that we saw in the case of the scalar field theory. We're gonna update this, parameterized by these frozen parts. And then we can push that transformation back to an update on the link itself. Okay, so that was updating just one link. We of course want to update the entire lattice. We can do that by stacking these sorts of layers and by composing the transformations in successive layers, you can update all of the links in your lattice in this nice gauge equivariant way. And here's a nice visualization of how information feeds from one layer into the next by taking input from not just the link you want to update, but from the surrounding part of the field configuration. So I want to emphasize that this is just, just one way of defining a gauge invariant layer. So we sort of look through a simple example where you compose your link into a single one by one loop. But what we've really done is define an entire class of these sorts of gauge equivariant updates. And you can do lots of creative things in this, in this framework. Now, 
I also want to say I'm not going to get into too much or really any technical detail. We've just gone through in gory detail for a simple case for U1 field theory, but you can actually extend this idea for SUN matrices that we were interested in for QCD. You just need to step via an eigen decomposition of the SUN link matrices. So in this onion plot here on the left, the part I described for U1 is the gray parts of the onion. And all of the additional complication for SUN, which is a non-abelian gauge theory, is in, in, in color here. For some of you who might have heard me talk about this before, this is the latest big advance. And although I'll skim the details, really, uh, the quick summary is that we call this a spectral flow. And the intuition is that each conjugacy class in SUN or in UN is the set of all matrices with some particular spectrum. For example, all, all matrices with some given eigenvalues. And then what our kernel function should do intuitively is move density between different n tuples of eigenvalues while preserving the eigenvectors. And we show that that's exact in our paper. You can define this kernel um, generically as an invertible map that acts on the list of eigenvalues of the input matrix and is equivariant under permutations of the eigenvalues, but leaves the eigenvectors alone. And so you can extend this here as some nice visualizations for SU2, SU3, SU4 in various formats. But um, for the purpose of this talk, we'll stick with U1, which is also particularly nice because it has a um, critical slowing down problem in just two dimensions. So back to our example here for our U1 field theory, where we have just one complex number, either the i thevis or a complex number on the unit circle per link on a two dimensional lattice. So we want to sample these field configurations according to the exponential of the action. And what the action looks like for this theory is this, it has only one free parameter. It's written in terms of plaquettes, which are just products of the links around this loop here. And so we can study um, this theory for theories with different parameters beta, where we take different couplings again, um, such that we have a critical limit. So we can choose to study couplings as beta becomes larger, and then we have a continuum limit or a manifestation of critical slowing down as beta becomes large. So what this looks like then is exactly the same as what we saw before. Now my picture of the prior distribution before we had a uniform Gaussian real number at each site on a two dimensional lattice for our scalar field theory. Now we can choose uniform variables, but each link here is, is a variable on a circle. Again, we have a composition of some number of coupling layers. So in this case, we have 24 of these coupling layers where each coupling layer is a mixture of non-compact projections. So that was one of the examples I gave of, of, of different transformations that you can do on the circle. Um, you can also use splines. You can use any of the transformations I suggested. These ones happen to have non-compact projections where each one of those transformations is parameterized through convolutional neural networks. So what that means is the parameters of say the non-compact projection or the spline are given by the output of convolutional neural networks. So even though the non-compact projection of the splines themselves don't have very many free parameters, you can build in expressivity by parameterizing them with a very complicated function with very many free parameters, for which neural networks are very useful. So each of them has neural networks with some number of hidden layers, and then you can train just like we did before um, and optimize just by drawing samples from the model. So self-training again with some stopping criterion and then you can sample from the model. So again, we see the same sort of success that we saw in the case of the scalar field theory. So we see that critical slowing down is significantly reduced again at the upfront cost of the fact that you have to train the model to start with. So what I'm showing here in this figure is sampling of the topological charge, which is defined here as this sum over the arg of these plaquettes, which are the products of links around these unit squares. So you can really think of this topological charge as being the, the winding number of the gauge field. It's, it's quantized, it's global, it's an integral over all space time. And what you see here on the horizontal axis, we have the steps in our Markov chain. And in the blue, you see one of the conventional approaches, Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo, and you see that as you go along in the Markov chain, you get stuck in these topological sectors. You're, you're not sampling all of the different values of the topological charge. It's constant for very long periods of time. 
similarly for so this is a heat bath algorithm in black this is another one of the conventional approaches you can see it, it, it's better but it's still fairly stuck and then in, in the orange behind everything you can see the sampling through the flow model that you're really exploring all of the topological sectors very efficiently so what this translates into is having to take uh, fewer samples that achieve independent updates than you do using the more conventional methods which results in a decrease in cost so if we look at the same sort of figure, but now in terms of the cost to generate each independent sample, which is what's shown on the vertical axis here on a log scale, you can see that as we move along the horizontal axis, that's along a critical line, the sampling from the conventional approaches becomes exponentially more expensive. The autocorrelation time becomes longer. With the flow-based model, however, you see that sampling remains fairly constant. So there is some increase here, and that comes because it becomes more difficult to train your models to high fidelity, to high acceptance, as you get to larger couplings. Um, so it's the trade-off of challenges in sampling for challenges upfront in, in, in training. Um, but it's up here at the large values of coupling, orders of magnitude more efficient than sampling via any of the conventional approaches. So just to be fair as well, the cost of each sample is about the same between the blue and the orange lines, the cost to generate a single sample via the black approach here is about a factor of two cheaper, um, but that of course can't make up for the orders of magnitude difference we see here. So really in, in genuine computational terms, it's more efficient to use the machine learning approach for sampling. So we see this as a great success. It's a proof of principle of an efficient, um, a provably exact machine learning algorithm for lattice quantum field theory that we can see as orders of magnitude more efficient at sampling um, than conventional approaches. So we have recently put out a um, notebook tutorial on the archive, which goes through all of the technical details of this sort of a sampling approach, if you'd like to play with it. And so I showed you one field theory. I also said that we've already extended to SUN. Um, the big work is to scale to the scale of state-of-the-art calculations. Um, and all of the logistical difficulties of training very, very large models to produce very, very high dimensional samples. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but it's incredibly promising. And so of course, um, my focus has been really on fundamental physics and of using ab initio AI to improve theoretical physics calculations. But all of these sorts of approaches have lots of interdisciplinary relevance and applications. So the discussion about how to write down flows on circles, on compact connected manifolds. Well, the angles in the joints of a robot arm are of course uh, living on connected manifolds. And so all of the techniques we develop there are also relevant in other applications. Similarly, these sorts of sampling approaches, um, there's been parallel work in molecular genetics and drug design using the same sorts of ideas for sampling approaches in a different context. So the summary then, really, before we move into questions, is that it's just the very beginning of this field and of our new center. Um, but it's already clear that there is huge potential for ab initio AI to make a big impact in this, in this example to our understanding of the structure of matter, um, both for its own sake and as part of our quest to understand the physics beyond what we know. So thank you very much. Excellent. Fiala, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for, for giving this colloquium. Uh, audience, you are going to have a chance to uh, ask questions. I'm going to give you the ability to unmute yourself. So I invite you to go ahead if you have a question and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it. Hello, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, talk. I have a couple of quick questions, please. Yes, please. Uh, one is uh, you mentioned going on a circle or general compact manifold. Statistics there is very different from statistics <coughs> in Euclidean space. So how do you deal with that? <coughs> yeah, so ultimately what we want in our field theory calculations is we want you know, SUN matrices on each link of the lattice. And so when I mean we have a Euclidean space-time lattice, it, it's that grid, but with SUN matrices on the links of that grid. 
So I'm not sure if that exactly answers your question, but the Euclidean part of the lattice field theory calculations um, is the space-time structure of this grid. But what that sample looks like, sort of just in, in, in terms of what we want to generate is one of these SGN matrices on each link of that space-time grid. So that's actually exactly the problem that we want to that we want to address is this sampling on the compact manifolds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And another one, uh, you have a uniform grid. Would it, uh, can it be beneficial to consider uh, more uh, sophisticated, uh, like an, a graph with uh, weights, not equal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah pe people have tried various things in the history of lattice field theory with, with different types of grid structures. Um, ultimately, a Uniform grid has a number of benefits. I mean, as these samples are so expensive to generate, typically they're generated at a community level and shared globally. So something simple that's usable for as many calculations as possible is very valuable. But also as soon as you break down the symmetry groups, um, uh, when you go from the continuum to your grid, you're breaking down to the symmetries of the hypercube and that induces mixing between your operators in a quantum field theoretic way. And you wanna sort of induce as little mixing as possible. So breaking the symmetries as little as possible is usually a good thing. So there are, there are advantages to having a regular grid. Uh, very often having one dimension with a different spacing can be incredibly helpful though. And so certainly variations are used strongly in the community. Thank you. Hi, Fiala. This is Ike speaking. Um, really nice talk. Yeah. I enjoyed it a great deal. And I'm curious about this training cost because I'm wondering if the training cost might accelerate as you have larger um, dimensions on your links uh, as you're currently going forward with because of the, you know, uh, training might slow down because you have lots of these hyperbolic points where the, the, the training gets confused and might get stuck. Do you have an idea about how it will grow as N grows for SUN? Yeah, so it, it, it grows as N grows for SUN, certainly. Um, luckily, we mostly are interested in SU3, um, but for single links, we're actually able to go all the way up to SU100, which is much more than we need. Um, our sort of bigger challenges on the training costs are as we go to very large volumes and we need very, very large networks and actually training them efficiently is a challenge. Um, we've found ways of using hierarchical models where you can train on a smaller volume first and then inherit the parameters on larger volumes that helps. Um, but we're definitely facing a big engineering challenge of making this work at scale. Um, luckily, what we're ultimately, what, luckily what we've also found is that it's very easy to retrain a trained model to nearby values of parameter space, meaning that even if the upfront cost is very large, you can amortize it not just over wanting to generate a particular ensemble, but an ensemble with slightly different values of the Clark masses, slightly different lattice spacing. And so what we envisage is you pay a very large upfront training cost once, and then it really generates a, an entire suite of ensembles of field configurations that you can use for all sorts of diverse physics studies. So um, yes, the cost grows towards the limits we, we care. And yes, it's a significant cost, um, but we think ultimately it can be amortized. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Hank. Um, hi, hi, Fiala. I don't know if you remember, uh, we met. Yeah, I do, hey. In KIT. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wonderful talk, <laughs> just like it was uh, back then. So, so I, I have a question. Um, the, you know, QCD is obviously a very interesting and important problem. And, um, but, you know, when we try to use uh, machine learning for, you know, our scientific problems, we have domain specific issues and, you know, we come up with solutions for it, right? And it's your case, the if issue was to make sure things are exact and make sure the symmetry is enforced. Now, the question is, would there be a way that we can give back to machine learning? Like, is there something, is there a potential for what, we, what you've learned, what you've worked very hard to invent to solve the you know, uh, domain specific problem can, I don't know, have impact on larger world problems like, I don't know, self-driving car or just a, it's a question. Yeah, so I think the most obvious impacts are through one, the, the fact that we had to go beyond transformations on real lines to transformation on compact manifolds. Compact manifolds occur 
um, in all sorts of spaces. You know, if you're talking about visualization, if you're talking about angles, um, developing solid ways of using data on compact manifolds is a useful and transferable um, thing to do. Uh, our focus on exactness um, and it is perhaps most useful in, in applications in, in theory where you care about that, but also in other contexts. If you're generating images of faces, okay, you can generate just whatever images of faces you get, but maybe you want very specifically a percentage of those faces to have long hair or short hair. And so by doing something where you have tractable likelihoods, that also has applications in other contexts. Um, and thirdly, we really do have a, an extreme computational scale that we need to push to. So a lot of the developments that we make in terms of training and robustness um, that are going to push us onto exascale computing, those will be transferable across yeah, any other discipline. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hi, Phil. Um, hey, Phil. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, so I wanted to understand um, why you were using the CNNs um, for your model, and if, if it makes sense to use something like, like a graph architecture in place. Yeah, so we've, so you mean for what's parameterizing uh, inside each flow layer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've tried all sorts of things. Um, something nice about CNNs is that we have a way of transferring from a smaller volume simulations to larger volume simulations. Um, so basically anything hierarchical where we can reduce that training cost by working on smaller setups first is valuable. You, you could do that at some level with graphs, right, too. So that's another avenue to explore. Um, but, but that's the main motivation there. OK, thanks. Diallo, we also have questions coming in from YouTube. We've had over 30 people watching the YouTube live stream. and. A couple of questions have come in. They understand that uh, you know the nature of it means that they can't interact directly with you. But let me read those out to you. Yeah, the first great. is from Sam Lai, and and he asks, uh, any comment on applications in in calculation of part-time distribution functions and light cone distribution amplitudes, which involves time separation? Yeah. So part-time distribution functions. I mean, the fact that you're looking at uh, quantities defined on the light cone are hard to get at in lattice field theory, but there are several different approaches. Um, so one, you can compute moments. So X integrals where X is your longitudinal momentum fraction of the part on distribution functions. And then from calculations of a number of moments, reconstruct the functions themselves. And secondly, there's a whole class of approaches in lattice field theory, where what you essentially do is rotate off the light cone, compute something that you can compute in Euclidean space, and then rotate back through a large momentum extrapolation to get you back onto the light cone. And that's a very rapidly developing field. And so my answer to that is that this approach that we've been developing is generic to any lattice field theory calculation you might want to do. So the first step of any such calculation is this sampling of gauge fields. So since there are ways to study part on distribution functions in lattice field theory, this approach can help accelerate those calculations and enable those calculations that we can't currently do. Um, so as to the specifics of part on distribution functions, this, this is more of a generic tool that applies to every lattice calculation. But yes, lattice QCD can tackle PDFs at some level. Wonderful. And the second YouTube question is also from a Sam. Two questions, two different Sams. This is Sam Foreman, who asks, when comparing the integrated autocorrelation time for the trained model to generic HMC, was there any sort of tuning of parameters for HMC? For example, trajectory length, number of leapfrog steps, et cetera. Yeah, there was. So we, we tuned them. So if we think about the scalar case where there was a very clear comparison, we tuned them to have roughly the same acceptance. So um, tuned all of those parameters to give the acceptance about roughly the same, which was uh, approximately the best calculator comparison we could come up with. Excellent. Those are all the YouTube questions. Any other questions for Fiala? So in these SUN flows, you, you, you train them for a bunch of different ends. How, 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 uh, how high did you go exactly? And how was the uh, training time scaling with the dimensionality of the group or something like that? Yeah, so 
we went up to SU 100 or 150, but not for a lot of field theory, just for the single link type model. So, so, so you can write down the transformation on a single SU N matrix, and that we're able to train easily up to very, very large N. Um, for an actual field theory calculation where you have many, many of these SUNs inside a lattice, we only went up to SU3 um, because that's, that, that's our interest primarily. Excellent, thanks. Yeah. Are there any last questions for Fiala? There's, there's one question in the chat from well, Mike C. I missed it. Uh, it's quite a ways in the chat. Uh, Mike, would you mind un uh, unmuting yourself and asking your question? I can read it if you don't. Okay, I'll read it. So Mike Z asks, by using symmetries, how many degrees of freedom could you eliminate? Also, how would you compare your gains with respect to critical slowing down to the elimination of a degree of freedom? Yeah, so that's that's a complicated question. Um, it, it's 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 hard to give you a precise answer for the elimination of the degree of freedom because it's not as if we're going from having, um, you know, imagine a grid with, with nine sites to a grid with three sites. What we're doing is putting constraints. We, we still have the same number of degrees of freedom actually in the sample, but we're constraining the way those degrees of freedom are updated through the flow model such that if you start with a particular sample in your preliminary distribution, in, in, your, in your prior distribution, and you transform it, the one at the end will have the same transformation relationship. So that's so, so we're, we're not actually reducing the number of degrees of freedom we're feeding through the network at all. We're constraining um, the structure of the transformation itself. Um, and, and what was the second? Part of the question, sorry, Jim. One moment. Uh, also, how would you compare your gains with respect to critical slowing down to the elimination of a degree of freedom? Right. Um, so that's also, <laughs> I'm sorry, a, a difficult question to answer. So basically, if, if you imagine that you have an just from 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 volume, you have sort of an exponential challenge as you go to larger volumes, then the exponential gain you see with the flow models as opposed to traditional methods, maybe you can try to draw some analogy there. But ultimately, if we didn't build in the the gauge symmetries, we just couldn't train the models at all. So I can't tell you how how bad they were because we sort of we didn't get anywhere at all. So it's hard to make a a concrete statement on how much better something is than than failure. Excellent. Uh, there's a question by Eric in the chat. Hey. Eric. Oh, yeah, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, yeah. Inspired by some of the previous comments on convolutional networks and graph theoretic architectures, I was wondering if it's possible to transfer insights, physical insights that you learn from CNNs to more graph based architectures. And if that is possible, what might that transfer function look like? Yeah, so you're imagining training something with a CNN and then using those trained parameters in your architecture and wanting to transfer them somehow to uh, a graph architecture instead. That's right. Yeah, so that's something we haven't looked into at all. So we've, we've only tried transferring things between architectures that are in, in very closely aligned where there's a very clear mapping. Um, so I'm not sure honestly, if that's easy or, or, or not. So one thing we have noticed is that after training, you can prune a lot of the parameters of your architecture. So you can basically make all of your, your, the parameters defining each layer very sparse and maintain a lot of the gains. So, so presumably through a preliminary step of pruning and retraining into a sparse architecture, you could then make a connection to something with a graph structure instead of trying to go from your dense architectures directly there. It's a nice avenue to explore. Thank you. Excellent. 
All right. Well, uh, those were many good questions. We appreciate how many questions there were, and I'm sure that Fiala does as well. Fiala, on behalf of everyone here, we would like to uh, thank you one more time. It was great. You know, those of you that are out there, please give her a round of applause in your room. We are uh, really happy that we're going to be having this Wi-Fi collaboration series every two weeks for uh, for foreseeable, you know, for the for, for the next few months. And in particular, there was a question about whether slides would be shared. They will. And also a recording of this video will be made available on our YouTube channel. And you can also follow us for more information at, at iFi underscore news at, uh, on Twitter. So thank you very much, Fiala. That was fantastic. And we are so glad to hear about your work today. Uh, so have a good one, everyone. Uh, stay safe. Thank you very much. All right. Very good. Thank you, Fiala, and uh, I am going to sign off.